I am Frances Yeo, Head of Fraud Risk Learning and Awareness for Standard Chartered, and I'll be your moderator today. So let me start by introducing our presenters, starting with Terry Green. He's the Director and Lead uh, for Payment and Digital Fraud in the Corporate, Commercial and Institution Banking segments. Terry? Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining. Okay, we also have with us uh, Sunday Domingo, the Head of Digital Channels, Transaction Platforms, and also for Corporate, Commercial and Institutional Banking segments. Thank you, Francis, and very happy to be uh, with you today on this very important webinar. So welcome and thank you, audience, for joining us today. Well, this is a presenter-only session, which means your microphone and your videos will be disabled. Uh, if you have any questions, just use the Q&A chat on the right-hand panel of your monitor. So we're happy to accept your questions throughout this session, uh, but we will only uh, take your questions at the end of it. So, but please post them as and when you have a question. Okay. Well, Sunday, uh, you have been building digital solutions for corporate banking in over 18 years. Uh, what significant evolution have you noticed during this time? Um, well, Francis, I think in the recent years, what we have seen is that you know, many businesses all over the world are are digitalizing, um, and and we are in a hyper digital age uh, at the moment. So, and 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 you know, what 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 are the motivations for that? Right? Certainly, digital solutions provide new business opportunities as well as you know, allowing companies to increase efficiencies and automation. Uh, but we do need to consider the impact of digitalization um, in the area of cybersecurity. And what we have seen is that um, cyber threats are also increasing in a similar pace as digitalization. Um, an estimated 500 billion annual cost to the global economy due to cybercrime. And, and in the financial services industry, we have seen that cyber threats can affect um, connected payment systems such as SWIFT, um, and we have seen many sort of cases in the media where that has taken place. Uh, so, so in this backdrop of increasing threats, uh, what we also see is that in response, banks have invested significantly in strengthening the banking platforms and, and the network infrastructure. Um, and certainly in Standard Chartered Bank and in CCIB, we put a lot of thought into protecting the bank's information assets uh, from increasing cyber threats, right? So everything from distributed denial of service attacks, phishing, malware, as well as these days, more and more social engineering scams, such as business email compromise. Um, but when we look at the trends and the, the cases that we see in, in the market, uh, what we increasingly see is that the vulnerability actually lies in the weakest link of the chain. And, and let's face it, the weakest link in the chain is actually the human being, the person, right, sitting in front of the computer. And, and for our clients, um, if you work in the corporate treasury, in the payables department or the finance department, you are typically the gatekeeper right, of your company's finances. And at the same time, you're very connected into banking systems and platforms, as well as your company's critical systems, like ERP, TMS systems, or payroll systems. So this combination of technology connectivity uh, and access to the ability to transfer funds um, can make you very attractive target to fraudsters. Um, so, so while in the past, cybersecurity may have been the responsibility of an IT department, um, that is no longer the case. Uh, everyone, every one of us must understand the, our role and our responsibility for the company's cybersecurity defenses. Um, and, and that's why sessions like this, Francis, is super important. Right. I agree with you on that, uh, Sunday, especially uh, what you're saying about cybersecurity is everyone's responsibility. And in the past, truly, it is more of what we rely uh, the IT department to do. But these days, especially when we are all working from home and there's a larger population of employees working from home, we can't be complacent about cybersecurity. 
uh, phishing emails are so prevalent these days and, and anyone could just fall prey to it and expose the organization, right? Uh, so Terry, how do you think this evolution affects payment fraud, um, especially on, on the roles that uh, Sunday has mentioned, all these gatekeeper type roles? Um, so this notion of the weakest link in the payment chain, um, how, what is your thought about this? Yes, yeah, so, so exactly that, and just to supplement some of what Sunday's covered off there. So because banks uh, are moving more to digital first as a priority, and that whole digitalization world that we live in now, um, you know, we have strengthened up our defenses, uh, you know, banks, banks generically. And what that has meant in terms of the evolution of the fraudster is that absolutely they are now focusing their efforts on the client environment and, and that human behavior of, you know, they want, you know, we want to inherently trust, you know, what we're doing is absolutely the right thing. So something that we need to be conscious of that, you know, potentially the human is the weakest link in the chain. And, and one of the types of evolutions that we've seen is the fraudster using uh, scams, which, which we refer to them as authorized push payment scams. And what that basically means is that they are coercing clients or that person who has the ability to make transactions for that client into making payments that they think genuine. And they do that in a number of different ways, but usually it's quite a sophisticated social engineering attack and then it emanates in the movement of funds. So one of the things that Sunday spoke about as well is, is on email compromise. Um, can you also elaborate a little bit about that? Um, is, is that uh, also in relation to APP? Uh, how exactly does it happen? And uh, so so our clients who happen to be in those gatekeeper roles, they can then be clearer about how they can fall victim to such a scam. Sure. Yeah, so, so absolutely. Business email compromise is one of those types of APP scams or those authorized push payment type scams that we see. And it is the number one risk that we see across the industry that our corporate clients face today. So I think the FBI quoted up to the three-year period coming up to the 2018, you know, they were quoting that corporate clients had lost $26.2 in business email compromise type attacks. Um, so, so, you know, absolutely it's fundamental that we, we kind of get this right, which is the number one threat. Two of the main MOs I want to cover off is it, it, how these business email compromise attacks play out. One is CEO fraud. Um, this is where... Um, the poster impersonates the CEO of an organization and that might be the CEO or a senior, you know, a senior executive within your own organization targeting those who are making transactions and who, act, who have access to um, transaction processing systems in your infrastructure um, using their position of authority to coerce that person into making a transaction and usually there's an element of pressure put on that person as well They'll, they'll absolutely use their position of authority to say, I demand this payment, I need it now, um, urgency is applied, and, and often it's kind of, you know, I've not got access to the system to do it myself, and therefore, going to an important business meeting, and by the time that business meeting's finished, I want those funds available in the account, right? So there's that time pressure put on that, on that individual, and again, you know, focusing on, on that weakness and human behavior, trust that that is a genuine um, a genuine request for the payment. The CEO fraud is, is, is one of the types of scams. The other one that we see of how this MO plays out is um, in invoice redirect. This is where potentially it could be your supply chain that's been compromised. If it's not your own business email, if it's not your own email that's been compromised, um, where again, the, the fraudster learns the behavior that you have with your suppliers. It knows who your trusted suppliers are. Um, and because they've done an element of uh, intel through the social engineering campaign that they potentially launch, you know, in advance of this, of this request for movement of funds, they'll have learned your payment, your, your email traffic in relation to your payments. They'll know who your suppliers are. They'll know, you know, what the, what the request for payment is in relation to, you know, specifically which good it refers to, what amount, what payment, you know, the due date of the payment. They'll know who that request usually comes from and the types of language that they use in that email as well. So it's really sophisticated in terms of it can really seem when that email lands on the person making that payment, it can really seem authentic and genuine uh, because of all of that info that they've gathered as part of that attack. So they will then 
supply that person doing the transaction with potentially new account details to process too, and they'll provide the genuine reason for that. And so, you know, um, there's, there's issues with that account at the moment, the one that you usually settle to. So can you just please, on this one occasion, transfer the funds for those goods to this new account? Um, and obviously, you know, that person will act thinking it's a genuine request. And before you know it, the funds have gone to this account. And, and actually, the first you hear about this is often not straight away. It's often when that supplier says mm. maybe a week, maybe, you know, the month on the line, they say, we've not had them, you not had, you know, you're not settled your invoice for those goods. And, and, and lo and behold, you know, the client thinks that they have. By that time, the funds have gone sometimes overseas and, it, and it's really hard to get those funds back. That's how we see it out. And, but there are, you know, there are sort of the kind of these cases are out there in the public domain. Now, I'll, I'll refrain from using, you know, the, the, the kind of calling out which corporations have fallen victim to these attacks. But there are, you know, if you, if you do look on the internet, you know, you can see, you know, where this has become prevalent in the media as well. There's been some big ticket items. I mean, just to call out two. I mean, two corporations that fell for this type of scam, you know, lost 30.8 million in one attack and 46 million in another attack in US dollars. So, you know, it, we're not talking small amounts here. We're talking, you know, the, the fraudster is going for, for the whole lot um, if they actually get the compromise right. Hmm. Well, I've, I've also read about a French movie company uh, where the CFO fell prey to it, thinking that the uh, email uh, was authentically from the CEO. And so uh, $30 million was released. Uh, so these kind of things do happen. And I agree um, when Sunday brought up all these gatekeeper roles and also the people who are dealing with the finances day to day, they are more prone uh, in the sense that the fraudsters deliberately target them. I think what is uh, also more worrying is the fact that, Terry, when you describe that they know your behavior, they know the style that you write in. They, so they have been observing and, and spying uh, for a very long time. Um, so, so Sunday, you have worked with a lot of digital platforms. What kind of controls do you think organizations should be putting in place? What should they be more mindful of um, to reduce this kind of risk and exposure to fraud? Um, so, Francis, thanks for that. I think as banks, obviously, we have very stringent controls. And I think some of the things that we as banks do could also be meaningful for a lot of our uh, corporate clients. Um, so firstly, as a bank, uh, what we try and do is we, we take a layered security approach, right, in terms of how we protect and secure our network and our banking platforms. Um, as, as you mentioned, I think data is actually a key asset. And sometimes getting access to the data, the transactional data, helps people detect patterns of payment behavior and transactional behavior that could then be used, right, to execute the, the, the fraud. So I think protecting the data is of utmost important. Um, and as a bank, what we do is we have layers that include um, uh, firewall perimeters and as well as detection, intrusion detection monitoring, as well as regular penetration testing uh, on our banking platforms. Um, now, obviously, some of our corporates, you know, will not go to the same lengths, but the same practices to make sure that the infrastructure of your corporate tre uh, treasury or ERP environment is well protected is, is certainly a good practice. Um, now, when you communicate with your bank, it is also important, right, that this is a secure communication. Um, and when you're using Internet banking systems specifically, uh, we need to make sure that there are stringent customer authentication in place to make sure that any instruction that the bank receives can be fully authenticated and authorized. And one best practice really is to make sure that um, you always use two-factor authentication uh, for both login and transaction signing, right? Why is that? Because two-factor authentication just means that when you log in, you have you're logging in with two factors one is something you know which is typically a password and a second factor which is typically something you have or something you are a token or a biometric fingerprint um because it's just harder for a fraudster to compromise two factors whereas a password a single factor is easily compromised and we have seen many cases where a simple downloading of malware 
can actually allow the fraudster to, to steal your credentials, right? So that is a very important uh, piece where that is a best practice recommendation. Now, from a banking perspective, obviously we try to help um, the security of our platforms by making sure that we implement things like transaction monitoring capabilities so that we can actually ensure that whatever our clients are doing, that these are logged in a comprehensive audit trail. Um, many internet banking systems provide the capability to set up out of band security notifications, right? Uh, for their, for corporate clients so that, for example, you want to set up an SMS alert or an email alert to be sent to you whenever a payment above, let's say, a certain threshold amount has gone out of the, the internet banking platform. So that is a good way, right, to actually be able to I um, monitor, right, potentially high-risk transactions. Um, additionally, um, you know, many banks today, we are also looking at cyber specific cyber threat monitoring solutions that include real-time detection for things like device anomalies and as well as, um, just, you know, looking at suspicious activities by leveraging a risk-based scoring model. Um, so what does that mean? For example, if you are logging into an internet banking system, you know, and every day you log in from Singapore, and all of a sudden tomorrow you're logging in from, from Russia, then we know that this is actually outside your normal behavior. And as a bank, most banks typically will be able to sort of um, flag that as a potentially suspicious activity and, and kind of put um, put a suspension on, on that account or at least notify the client. Now, as Terry mentioned, though, we have seen that fraudsters are not really targeting the banks, right? So it's great that banks have put in all these controls, but at the end of the day, they are targeting corporates. And, um, and it's very easy, uh, for, uh, fraudsters to actually attack sort of vulnerabilities that, that we've heard that Terry talked about. Um, so I think from my perspective, um, if you're accessing your internet banking, it is absolutely imperative that you, that we do best practices, including two factor authentication. Um, I have sort of observed incidents in the industry where, um, the client has mistakenly downloaded a malware that caused their internet banking credentials to be compromised. Um, and if you're only logging in with a password, it's very easy then for the process to access your banking information. And banking information is very sensitive to Terry's point. They start to be able to see your supply chain. Who are you paying to? Who are your customers? Who are you receiving payment from? Once they have this data, it's very easy to execute something like an invoice redirection that, that Terry talked about. Um, so, so these are the things that we really need to be mindful of because um, you're not just protecting um, the ability to transfer funds. You also want to be conscious that you need to protect your sensitive information, right? So, so fraud awareness sessions, programs like this one, is something that we also recommend our, our corporate clients to do. Also do a fraud awareness and training within your own organization. This is very important because your employees should be trained so that they can become a human firewall, right? Because we, we can't just rely on the technical firewall. And um, it cannot be overemphasized that when it comes to cybersecurity, employee education and awareness are critical. And that without this, Technical controls are almost bound to fail. Mm. Uh, what about you, Terry? So with all those controls, um, as, as we then dial up or as our clients uh, look at ways to dial up their controls, so meanwhile, what would be the red flags that they should be looking out for? Yeah, the, the, there's many, actually, that we see from some of these use cases, but I just wanted to cover off you know, some of the main ones that we, you know, we generically see through these types of attack. So um, it's kind of a theme that we've covered off, but but it's this unusualness of request for transfer of money. You know, is, is this request usual? Um, it's kind of ask yourself, you know, you will know your suppliers, you will know your customers, you will know the usualness of that kind of email behavior that you usually see from those uh, parties. So, you know, it, again, are they asking you to, 
make the payment to a new beneficiary account? Is that is that kind of usual? Is it in the same currency? That, you know, for for example, that you would usually deal with. Um, what about the dialogue that they're using? Are, 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 you know, quite crudely, sometimes you see them use you know, dear sir, madam, you know, quite a formal approach when actually that's not really how they usually speak to you over email. So it might be you know more informal as a hi. Um, and they're quite crude, you know, they're quite crude things that potentially they've not picked up in that in that um, that kind of that social engineering gathering of data. These are the types of usualness of requests for transfer that we, we want you to look out for. Um, the other things to look out for is email address. Um, so, so obviously if it's been spoofed, um, again, you know, some, sometimes quite crudely, it might just have one or two characters which are, aren't usual supplier or that customer that you usually deal with um it could have you know a numeric you know, jit in there it could have a uh, you know an alpha digit in there you know added on to the end it looks very much like it's that usual person's name um but actually it's not and one of the ways to kind of spot whether or not that that's that tactic is being used is to hover over the email address it will identify the full suffix of that email user and you'll be able to quickly see if there's a, an additional character in there or a character missing, which is not the genuine email of, of that customer or supplier. Um, the other thing is, again, and, and we kind of see this, you know, forces have got more sophisticated, but we do still see grammatical errors and spelling errors in some of these crude attempts to you to transfer money. Um, but that's something else to look out for in the email as well. Um, and kindly, the final one is, and it kind of links to the CEO type scam that we see. But you know, is the request urgent? You know, is it is it, is it being made seem urgent? Is it being made seem highly confidential? For example, so you know, please do not tell your colleague. But you know, we'll urgently transfer these funds that you don't have chance to kind of bounce it off someone if you, if you if you feel mm. it's not usual. Um, you're not sure about it. They're placing this, you know, element of, you know, high pressure, highly confidential on you. You, you know, you're you're more willing to kind of act on that in terms of, like, again, you know, back to the human behaviour element and the weakness. Okay, so that's good advice. Um, I'm I'm thinking of the current environment where more and more organisations are allowing their uh, employees to work from home. I'm I'm also thinking that our home environment is not as, as secure or not as well equipped when it comes to cybersecurity as compared to, to when we're in the office. Uh, what have both of you observed as being, um, are, are there any fraud schemes or, or are there any threats that you have seen uh, been, uh, you know, it increased uh, as a result of employees working from home? So what would be the vulnerabilities uh, in the current environment? Uh, shall I start with you, Sunday? Um, yes, thanks, Francis. So I think some of the key principles that Terry talked about still hold true. Um, I think when it comes to social engineering or business email type of compromise of attacks, um, they, they will typically like flag something as urgent, confidential. And, and I think working from home, maybe it, it increases that, that threat, right? Because Typically, if you're in the office, you probably will have access to documentation or additional data that will help you verify an urgent request. And if at home, you don't have the same access to documentation or data that will allow you to validate, um, I think that that adds a certain layer of vulnerability. Um, now, I think uh, additionally, um, just the remote uh, working environment um, also lends itself probably to um, having more people become vulnerable because not just access to the information which they would have physically in the office, perhaps access to the actual people. Um, so to, ter to Terry's point, if you want to actually run it by a colleague and if you're not able to reach them as easily because of the remote working environment, um, I think that that is a challenge. Um, other than that, if we look at sort of, you know, accessing your banking systems, um, typically, because you're doing that through through the inter normal internet anyway, whether you're at home or in the office, all of those sort of best practices around internet banking will still kind of hold true. Um, but yeah, those are just some of initial thoughts from me. 
Mm. What about you, Terry? What do you think? What What are the, the the vulnerabilities that have increased in the current environment? Yeah. So so what we see is because you know you know corporates aren't able to get into their usual places of work, their usual offices to work. You know, more and more of these staff are, are working from home. Um, Plus, there's a switched on to the fact that email is being used more um, to initiate transactions as part of contingency procedures that are potentially put in place by the corporate organization. Um, you know, they might not have access to usual fax machines, potentially is where they, they would also initiate payments from. So the fraudsters have really caught onto this and, 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 you know, they're using, you know, that knowledge, um, socially engineer it, you know, clients across the industry. I mean, one of the, um, one of the industry um, kind of stats that came out during COVID, for example, was that they'd seen a 300% uplift in social engineering attacks due to COVID inception, right? And, and that was purely based on the fact that they knew that, you know, staff were, were, who had access to transaction processing systems were now processing those transactions using email to the chain to initiate that. Um, you know, it was kind of low-hanging fruit for the fraudster to go for that uh, in terms of, and, and currently, you know, we're all, you know, there might be some elements of the globe returning to BAU practices, but ultimately we're still right in the midst of COVID pandemic and absolutely that threat still exists. That's something that we need to look out for. I think the other aspect is, you know, we're aware, it's a bit deeper than that, but we're aware, you know, throughout the industry that there are job losses, there are financial press pressures that, you know, the, these people are under at the moment. And sheer prevalence of that means that, you know, there are people now who potentially weren't fraudsters in the past, but they're, they're feeling pressures. You know, there might be, you know, mortgages at stake here. Um, you know, the, their income has been affected. And we're seeing that people that wouldn't usually consider fraudulent attacks actually, you know, becoming fraudsters as well um, because of those financial pressures that COVID has, has introduced. So that's something that we need to be mindful of and, and you know for corporate clients need to consider their staff members around that you know and whether or not their staff members are impacted by this and you know whether or not there's an element of, of insider fraud uplift because of that those types of financial pressures that people are under mm. okay well all right uh so that covers the main part of our presentation i see that we've got a few questions that have come in on the board um Okay, let's start with the first one. Can you give us a few pointers to detect invoice fraud? Can you give us a few pointers to detect in invoice fraud? So I believe, Terry, uh, this is for you. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, uh, hopefully, I think this question came in before I covered the, the, the aspects around the red flags to look out for. Um, but yeah, you know, unusual requests for, mon for money transfer from your suppliers, you know, just to reiterate that, um, you know, are they asking you to kind of make that transaction to a new beneficiary account sometimes it look you know even in a different currency um you know there's some of the, the things to look out for again you know the email address suffix is is a key point as well hover over the email address they look different but kind of the email addresses that you usually um you usually interact with when 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 making money transfers um but just to elaborate a little bit i, I mean something that i wanted to kind of bring out today was some top tips um, that our clients should, should kind of adopt and we'd encourage them, encourage them to adopt if they, if they don't do already. Um, and these, these tips are available also on our, our client facing sc.com page. So, so please, please revisit that. But, but some of the key ones just to cover off is, you know, never disclose your, your authentication credentials, um, to anyone. You know, the, the bank will never ask for your full authentication credentials. Um, but please don't do that. This leverages a point around Sunday mentioned earlier where, you know, we would encourage also that you implement factor authentication or, or you at least have, you know, second authorization of a payment instruction. Don't leave it to one single user in your own environment that, that authorize that payment. It will just make it it's an extra layer. You know, Sunday mentioned this human firewall. If you've all of a sudden got two human firewalls, you know, the, the, the kind of fraud attack can be, you know, more difficult for us to, to carry out. Um, do not open emails from unknown senders, obviously. Um, sometimes they have embedded links, you know, please do not click on them. This is where, you know, the malware inf infiltrates your, your environment, infiltrates your email. And this is where that intelligence gathering exercise uh, attack begins to emanate. 
the, the further, you know, the, the actual request for payment further down the line of that attack. Please don't open any link. They'll start to use, you know, use your email or traffic traffic to learn your behaviors. Um, so that, that subsequent attack can seem really genuine and authentic. So, so that's something that we would uh, air against. Um, enable DMARC. Um, so so it's protect against the main spoofing uh, DMARC. And and often, you know, there's a, there's a misconception that DMARC is auto enabled. Um, you know, on your on your workstation, it is not. Um, you need to enable that. Um, again, on on the sc.com pages, we've got some tips on how to enable DMARC. Um, install antivirus uh, and, and anti malware software. Exactly what it says in the tin. It'll 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 protect you against those types of malware attacks. So if you spuriously click on a link which is malicious, you know that will provide you a level of coverage around that and a level of protection. Um, the other bit, and I think this was mentioned earlier, potentially by Francis, I think, um, provide regular fraud awareness. Um, you know, have a strategy from the top, which is sponsored by your senior ex executives. Um, it's important that you have your own fraud awareness programs, um, especially now. You know, we, we've covered off the fact that the process have evolved moving into the client's environment rather than attacking the bank. I mean, attacking the bank hasn't gone away, but, but certainly in terms of fraudsters evolution they are going for um you know that weakness in human behavior and that's that's exactly what we're seeing in terms of the industry numbers um and then just two final points you know don't be rushed you know again that ceo fraud um example um and listen to your instincts you know if it doesn't feel right stop and take five um you know think about what you're doing before you actually push the button on making that transaction yeah. So look out for emails that says urgent. Uh, so that's one of the, the, the repeated uh, thing that you've mentioned, the repeated advice. Check the URL, make sure that it matches with what uh, you're, you regularly receive from your supplier. Uh, so there are, there are all these good advice. And you mentioned about malware, about um, downloading antivirus software. So there is a question here that just came in as you spoke about that, uh, probably that triggered it. Can you detail a bit about, or can you share more details uh, a bit about malware threats? Uh, yeah, I, I can. I mean, um, the different types of malwares that are out there. I mean, basically, it's malicious software, right? Um, what we see, this is the cyber-enabled element of how these scams play out in terms of the malware. Um, so we used to get malware which would actually try and inject transactions into the into the infrastructure now of course that that problem is not going away but where banks are more mature now in the protecting their own infrastructures what the malware does now it's it's kind of moved towards the kind of spyware type attack um where it's kind of you know infiltrating your email chain and it's just sitting there you, you're potentially unaware that the spyware is actually on your workstation and it's just kind of sitting there and it's kind of learning your usualness of email traffic, picking up, um, you know, I think, I think said before, but just picking up the, the, the usualness of behavior that you have with your clients, um, with your suppliers. So that it's kind of like it's the intel gathering stage of, of this kind of sophisticated scam, this authorized push payment scam. So actually the, the cyber element is not the where the money movement happens. It's still the human who's making the money transfer. Um, but the malware is being used to kind of gather that in to make that seem like a really genuine and authentic attack. Okay. Uh, so that's this question about fraud monitoring systems. How effective can fraud monitoring systems uh, be used to stop fraud? Can you give us an example? I guess this question is asking how a fraud monitoring system works uh, and it, in, in detecting and preventing fraud. Um, Sunday, do you have an opinion on that? Um, yeah, so, so Francis, um, at the heart of it, um, sort of fraud monitoring uh, capabilities really leverage analytics, right? So, so what you typically need to do is to have build some data analysis um, around your typical transactional patterns so that when something unusual actually occurs, you're able to kind of flag that as a potentially suspicious transaction. Um, so a lot of fraud monitoring system leverage AI 
machine learning and sort of data analytics models. And it's all about really doing a bit of a risk scoring, right, for every type of kind of transaction. Um, so, so that's kind of at the heart of, of what fraud monitoring does. Um, and, um, and yeah, and I think that is something that banks for sure have, have invested heavily in, right? As we kind of talked about. Um, but, um, yeah, and, and, and that's kind of what that's all about. I don't know, Terry, if you wanted to add more. Um, yeah, exactly that. You know, banks are, are leveraging, you know, different, different types of solutions, you know, there's kind of no, no vendor supply these solutions. There's kind of no silver bullet, you know, if I'm being honest. So that's why, you know, banks are developing a layered a detection model approach, um, from the back. Um, but some of the capabilities that, you know, are being invested in are around, I think Sunday mentioned a bit around device profiling, um, you know, anomalies in the device that you would usually use and uh, you know, initiate transactions, uh, right through to, you know, how normal that behavior is in terms of that transactional behavior. So is this, uh, you know, a new beneficiary, for example, is it new currency? So, you know, it's, it's kind of a multi-layered approach. It's kind of where banks are going to. Um, but yeah, you know, ultimately that's all, that, that's all I've got to give on that. Okay. Well, I, the next question, I believe you have already touched uh, a little bit about this. So the question asks, with fewer trades due to COVID and border closures, uh, do you expect a reduction in fraud? Uh, with fewer trades uh, and border closures due to fraud, uh, due to COVID, do you expect a reduction in fraud? I think you were mentioning, Terry, earlier on that, well, uh, businesses are suffering, so, so there are certain businesses that are under financial pressure and hence our fraud is increasing. Perhaps you'd like to reiterate that point and what are some of the things that we should look out for uh, with the increased activity from the process? Yeah, absolutely. You know, no decrease. Uh, in fact, you know, there's been an increase. So so it's kind of, you know, they're, they're leveraging, you know, the current pandemic and they're utilizing it as opportunity. I mean, you know, there's been things like, you know, fake PPE type scams as well, which our clients are facing as well. So, you know, targeting our clients, um, you know, and they're leveraging the fact that, you know, there is that element of financial strain on on corporations you know on individuals um you know and, and people are more likely to click on links where you know they're offered um a bit of money you know for a bit of advice or something that can seem really genuine um and obviously they've clicked on a link which then you know downloads the malware and infiltrates their email uh system so we've not we've not seen a decrease um across the industry you know i think i, I mentioned earlier you know we've seen a 300 percent uplift in social engineering attacks Due to the COVID pandemic, um, and that's and, and that's right from the inception. Um, so yeah, absolutely, it's still you know a, a significant threat that we're faced with today. Okay, well, that's uh, all the questions that we've received so far. Uh, if you have any questions, audience, please use the Q and A chat box, and you can post that up. Uh, so let me do a quick recap of all that we've covered today. So, firstly, when we talk about red flags, um, so what we want to spot, uh, and very often in 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 a lot of the training that we conduct, um, we I, I use this very simple recipe of uh, spot, stop, and report. So what do we spot? Uh, and those are the red flags. We want to make sure that uh, who we're dealing with is exactly the person that uh, we want to deal with and that is not an impersonator or a fraudster. So always verify with um, verify independently uh, if you receive a request, make sure that it's the actual authentic person who's asking you for the request and it's not a full female or it is not an email compromise uh, from an impersonator. Um, so that spot. Uh, Stop, uh, take five, stop, think about it, do not act on it, especially if the urgent is so called, uh, oh, sorry, especially if the request is so called uh, urgent. So take a minute, think about it, and then really assess whether or not it is urgent. Um, is it is it unnecessary pressure? Um, is the style of the request different from what the person uh, normally uh, sends to you? So take a minute and, and stop and think about it. And then report. This is, to me, uh, very important. And any time when there's a suspicious activity that you've noticed, uh, always escalate it. Tell someone about it because the earlier the report, the quicker you report, the better the chances of a recovery um, happening. Let me take a look at the box. 
Um, so we have no more questions at this stage. Uh, so, Terry, do you have any closing words for our audience? Um, yeah, I mean, you know, thank you all for joining. Um, you know, we want to do more of this messaging um, out to our clients. Um, surely the fact that, you know, the, the evolution of the fraudster now is, is, is kind of operating in your own environment and, and ultimately we want to protect you uh, and help you protect yourselves. So I think, you know, ultimately I'd advise you to visit the, the se.com slash writing fraud pages where we've got some, you know, good information there. There's business email compromise videos available. Um, there's articles on there. There's, the, you know, the stuff around the recent pandemic and, and, and all the bits how to look out, you know, look out what to look out for and how to protect yourselves. What about you, Sunday? Before we close off, do you have any last words for our audience? Uh, thank you, Francis. And I think it's been quite engaging and, and very thoughtful questions from, from our audience. Um, I, I, I think, you know, as, as Terry just mentioned, um, we want everyone to sort of be increasing their awareness, right, of broad threats, understand your, your role and your responsibility to your company. Um, to secure your company's assets, right? Whether that is data or, or financial assets. Um, and, and make sure that the best practices are well understood throughout the organization. Um, and it's all, all about actually increasing awareness in everyone and making sure that, um, we are, yeah, building that human firewall because that is super important. Right. So fraud fighting, it's definitely a partnership of uh, while we in the bank uh, are, are strengthening our defenses. Uh, well, what do the fraudsters do? They then look at the weakest link, as what Sunday has said earlier. So um, audience, do make sure that you uh, look at avenues in tightening your controls against fraud. Uh, check out our web page, uh, sc.com backslash fighting fraud. I reiterate what Terry has said. On the CCIB News and Views webpage, you will find a lot of articles on fraud prevention specific to organizations, uh, as, uh, and there is one on the current COVID environment. Um, there are also cybersecurity tips that you can look forward to. So thanks a lot for joining us today, um, and stay safe. If you're celebrating Thanksgiving, travel safe. And well, one final advice from me, if you are going to leverage on the Black Friday uh, discounts, do take note that the fraudsters are also shopping at the same time. But in this case, they are shopping for your banking account. So do be extra vigilant. Well, thank you for joining us and stay safe all. Bye-bye. <laughs>